Welcome back to True Story with John Gibson. Uh, today joining us is Justin Olivier. Uh, Justin is a Army vet, a former member of the 1st 506 Infantry Regiment. Um, great human being, good friend. Justin, thank you so much for joining me. Hey, it's a pleasure to be here. No matter how bright eyed and bushy tail I am at this time in the morning, it's been a while. It's been a few years since I've been up this early. Yeah. So poor Justin. Uh, so I'm currently, it's, it's 8 a.m. my time in Chicago and he is in Las Vegas. So is that two or three hour difference? It's six o'clock here. Okay, so. so it's a two solid two hour difference. <laughs> and of course, he had to get up early to prepare. So I appreciate that even more. Uh, you know, extra sacrifice <laughs> to be with us today. Uh, you're the man. You're the man, Justin. Um, so yeah. uh, there's a million reasons and there's like a hundred questions I could ask you, but I feel like I really wanted to concentrate a little bit today and uh, provide some context to everybody because you have such an amazing story. And I feel like you, you, could, you are, but could be such a beacon of positivity for so many other people. But I wanted to give a little context first before we don't jump into some of the, the, the bigger stuff. So um, just kind of out of the shoot, do you mind sharing a little bit just about your background as it relates to like, what attracted you to enlisting and like what was that initial foundation like hey why did you want to enlist and you know maybe choosing army and, and what that was like okay originally i was actually going to enlist out enlist into the military when i was 18 coming out of high school because i was born and raised in iowa so it's like you know little farm town so it's like you know you had the gi bill had all these opportunities that the military presented you and it's like mm -hmm. okay you know it's a way for me to help pay for my own college it's a way for me to um do this or that and honestly with a lot of kids from small farm towns it's a way to get out of there yeah. you know they want to find something bigger but um i'd already committed to college and my grandma i mean with all her infinite wisdom it's like she's already she's she always preached if you're gonna do something you're gonna be committed to it so it's like I'm like all right no <clears throat> I've already committed to college, so I went had that route. But then, of course, 9-11 happened. Right. And so, and I remember waking up that morning, re watching it. I mean, pretty much the world had stopped on its axis. But, you know, at that time, I'm like, you know, I, I got to finish what I started. So um, I went ahead and graduated college. But at that time, I, was, I went in for criminal justice and psychology. Mm -hmm. And my intent was to go, back, go into law enforcement. Mm -hmm. But at that time, the, the state of Iowa was in a hiring freeze. There weren't a lot of law enforcement agencies hiring. So I'm like, you know, I revisited the whole military again. And that I still felt like it was still my patriotic duty to at least serve and whatnot. And, mm -hmm. and I looked at kind of as, you know, because I, I eventually wanted to be onto a SWAT team or a federal response team or mm -hmm go i had bigger aspirations so mm -hmm. it's like you know, the military will give me that kind of training that i want for swat and a lot of these experiences i'll get that experience get out get back in law enforcement and kind of move on with my life but once i got into the military i started like really feeling like myself in there and mm -hmm. i'd actually contemplated just making a career out of it so mm -hmm. so what part of the, i guess for you that if it was like and I'm putting words in your mouth, but if it was sort of like a, a fish taking to water, what was it about the military that provided that? Like, where did you feel like you, you were so at home? What kind of what part of it? I mean, growing up, I was actually, I mean, I, I was, I wasn't quite a loner, but it's like I got along with everybody, but it's just, I kind of always felt like an outcast of, in a way, because I mean, yeah. when you grow up as a um, police officer's son and a teacher's aide, teacher's son, like you kind of get that kind of, all right, do we trust him? We're not going to yeah. popular kids like, all right, we ain't going to invite him to parties. He's going to be a narc yeah. and all this and that. Um, no, it kind of gave me a feeling of belongingness. Yeah. You know, being able to just kind of have a kind of found a home with people that had the like minded kind of beliefs and whatnot. And, that, and that's a great thing about the military is that it's, yeah. it is truly a melting pot of these different cultures, different yeah. backgrounds. Cause I mean, I was never exposed to a lot of these things. But it's like when I got there, it's like, I don't know, it, it just felt natural to be part of something bigger. Mm -hmm. It is pretty cool. Um, I imagine, too, that uh, to, to your point, all these different people from all different parts of the U.S. come together. And now you're all on the same team. Yeah, we're all part of this bigger thing with history, too. You know, these brothers that have sacrificed before you. That must be pretty awesome. Uh, 
Wow, pretty pretty cool. Um, can you talk maybe share a little bit about uh, your subsequent deployment and what that experience was like, and then maybe also your your injury? Share share about some some of that. Yes, I mean I enlisted in two thousand four, and by the time I got out of boot camp, and, and it was November, so I was assigned to the Fort Campbell with one hundred first. Mm. And when I got there, the, um, they had just stood up the Fourth Brigade, and so they we didn't really have a name. Yeah, I mean, we were kind of nameless. We were just known as 4th Brigade, 101st Airborne. And so it wasn't until about a month before we deployed in the following year that we finally got the designation for the 506th. Mm -hmm. And so um, so it was when, when you learn that you get the lineage, the designation of that lineage, the 506, because when, um, especially in the military community, you hear the 506th. It's like okay you think band of brothers that legacy that mm -hmm. they carry on so it's like you're just kind of like wow so um it's extra special i mean it means yeah, it's, it's so much. i mean you have and you hear the stories you i mean you see the band of brothers and everything and it's like okay you gotta carry on that tradition mm -hmm. so we subsequently deployed to iraq in 2005 and you know the, the typical deployment first time for me ever leaving the country wow. and you know, it's like, so it was a kind of, it was definitely a culture shock, of course. Yeah. And so, um, did you go to I Iraq? Yeah, I was in Iraq for from 05 to 06. Okay. And so, and we were stationed in Ramadi, hmm. Iraq. And at that time, it was like the second or third most dangerous city there, hmm. area there in Iraq at the time with the highest activity. Hmm. And so, of course, you know, 2005. Yeah. Yeah. In 06. And, you know, during that time, you know, you know, you face rockets, you face the typical, you know, firefights and everything else. And, you know, for, for me, it kind of got really, it really hit home a, a few times because I was personally um, hit by an IED about three or four months into the deployment. And I mean, there's been, there was other close calls that I had, you know, RPGs that landed mortars that sent shrapnel that pinged off of the turret of the Humvee I was in, um, an RPG that hit the back of my Humvee. That, and when you try driving one of those things with three flat tires on it, it's almost trying to wrangle a bowl. Um, yeah, the, it, I mean, it's difficult. And so, yeah, yeah. And so, I mean, I was exposed to a lot of blast exposures, and but um, the IED is what really kind of knocked me off my rocker quite a bit. I mean, it actually physically knocked me unconscious. I remember last thing I, then, you know, the last thing I remember from before I lost consciousness was just the flames and the heat coming up through the turret. And, you know, and then that's when I blacked out because at that time I was concentrating on turning, I was in a M113, which is an armored personnel carrier, which predates back to, um, the Vietnam War is when they first made their appearance, but wow. of course, over the years they've been upgraded. Um, so I was in the turn, I was trying to turn it, it locked in the position, and I was having a few choice words with it as I always did. And that's when then that's when the IED hit. And um, so in a way, that turn locking up actually kind of saved my life. Really? I mean, it I mean the whole experience changed me, but right. I mean, in retrospect, you know that turret actually ended up saving my life, even though you know, it locked up. So can, can you share a little bit about um, the actual, your, your injury and subsequent, the, the rehab experience of that? And then we'll, we'll kind of well, expand it. Oh, this, okay. This is, and this, this is about kind of a subject I've started getting really um, passionate about. And yeah, because my, well, I was knocked unconscious. I had lacerations. I had um, plot marks from shrapnel that went into my skin and, and um, it wasn't actually later, it wasn't diagnosed until later on. I mean, I went through a concussion protocol, just like football players do. Good. I was like, I had to stay awake for 48 hours. I had to be stay in observation. Well, after that trauma. Yeah, and, and, and I never left the FOB. I never left my unit. And so it's like, I went through the concussion protocol pretty much. And, and then after two days, like, all right, you know, good to go. We went back to work. That's essentially everything that happened, you know, they kept off observation, but after talking with people throughout the years and everything else, you know, people started slowly seeing the change, like gradual changes. And it wasn't 
diagnosed until after my second deployment when I got medevaced out of Afghanistan that, excuse me, um, I was actually diagnosed with a mild traumatic brain injury. Mm. So, and with, wow. when I was, and when, as I was going through that therapy, I was always going through that diagnosis. It started making a lot of sense to, as, as to um, what ch- the changes I was experiencing, like loss of memory, loss of motor function at times, and just um, a lot of things that's related to yeah brain injuries because right. at, that, at that time there wasn't a lot of studies done with yeah it was, it was starting to it was it was starting to kind of come about there was awareness but there wasn't really that much known about brain injuries at the time especially regarding combat because i mean the one of the biggest diagnoses that people focused on from combat veterans is ptsd right. which right. i which i also deal live with on a daily basis but no, it's it's the it's the invisible injuries that yes people never see of course because you know they're invisible and yeah um and so i mean it was 2008 when i finally got this diagnosed with the traumatic brain injury and they said and going through my history and everything else and the doctors kind of traced it back to the IED along with the math, uh, multiple blast exposures. So, right. I mean, which would make sense, but I mean, you're talking two years later, subsequently yeah. to get that, that, yeah. And man, unbelievable. Uh, so, I mean, you touched on it already, but um, you know, having had a traumatic brain injury, you know, what is life like today uh, physically for you? You know, how do you live with that and adapt physically now? And then also uh, you, we've talked privately, but, you know, maybe use this as an opportunity to share maybe some of the techniques you do or any words of advice you have for other veterans that also are, are dealing with PTSD and some of those repercussions. Um, you know, do you have any insight around that stuff? Yeah, and this is, I mean, it's one of the reasons I went into social work and counseling mm-hmm. um, because, I mean, it wasn't a smooth road at all for me. I mean, I, I mean I'm going to lay out a lot of things that, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people are afraid to, talk about PTSD, traumatic brain, especially PTSD, because there's a, such a strong stigma about it. Cause I mean, and I actually used to be, I used to feed into it and I'll, Me I'll too. that. And, um, totally. yeah. Oh, PTSD, you're going to it's like, and, and I've actually had to like help explain this to some of my classmates where I went back to school and you know, going back to school was a whole nother animal. It felt like you know, I was Adam Sandler and freaking, um, Oh, uh, what's that movie? Billy Madison. Yeah. yeah, Billy Madison. I felt like Billy Madison. I'm just like, yeah. But it's like, um, but people are afraid to talk about it. They're afraid to talk about PTSD yeah. in particular and yeah, because, all those things. Yeah. yeah, because people are like, oh, you have PTSD. You're you're gonna snap. You're gonna be in, right. go off on a tangent, and like, or you're gonna flip out. It's like, but they, but there's so much. And after studying social work and counseling, there's just so much more to PTSD than people mm-hmm. realize. Sure. It's the small little things. And so, um, and every once in a while, um, you, and because of my brain injury, every once in a while, you may have to like kind of redirect me or kind of sure. keep me focused because you're doing great. Oh, I know. But it's like <laughs> sometimes it's like I'll trail off and then I'll all of a sudden it's like, I can't remember what I was talking about. I can't remember where I was. So it's like, sometimes you might just have to rehash it for me. Sure. sure. Um, but yeah, there's just that heavy stigma around PTSD that, you know, mm-hmm. it's everything negative, but there's quite, I mean, I've had to kind of, and you asked me, you know, how have I kind of changed physically and changed the way I lived and everything else. Like I've pretty much, I kind of refer to it as kind of like an, an electrical outlet, electrical box, power box, where you might have to rewire things to make sure to get them to work how you want them to work again. And you kind of have to retrain yourself mm-hmm. on daily tasks. To, like me, it's like I use, I use checklists every day. I wake up each morning, it's like I make a checklist. It's like, all right, you know, this is what I need to get done. It helps That's keep so me funny, focused. I do too. Yeah. And, um, yeah. and I, and they actually have me on Adderall because a lot of my symptoms mimic that of ADHD mm, interesting. and so it's like it's, it's to help keep me focused um, sure. but when it comes to PTSD it's like so, I mean it definitely was not a smooth transition and mm. um, I mean and I'll I mean I'm very open about my experiences I'm very open about what I've gone through because I've learned that 
um, if people don't talk about things, other people's not going to learn about it. They're not going to understand it. And I'll admit, so, you know, I let my PTSD um, control me. Mm-hmm. And um, and technically, post-traumatic stress is a disorder according to the DSM-5. But I've after I've I had a counselor that um, actually explained it pretty well. It's like, yeah, it's you have post-traumatic stress. The only person that can make it a disorder is yourself and you know it's like and that's how you and it's, mm. you can overcome it and she explained it it says you know just think about the word disorder it's like mm. you separate you separate it between this and order and it causes disorder mm-hmm. in your life mm-hmm. and so it's like and that's what was happening it's like i was letting disorder control who i was i mean i mm-hmm. when i got out of the military i was busy working it's like i had i didn't have time to sit back and look back at my experiences i didn't have time to like kind of let things come down to earth mm-hmm. but um but once i got my va disability and once i got um all this my back pay and everything my my current wife she she implored me to kind of step away take a break just you know because I had a lot, because I deal with blood clots in my legs. I deal with a lot of physical ailments now too. Mm-hmm. And she's like, you need to take a break. You need to like kind of get yourself healthy. Mm-hmm. Oh. And it actually was a double-edged sword. Yeah. I mean, I got to t- focus on myself being physically healthy, but what happened was the emotional toll came crashing down on me. Right. You had to face it. <laughs> yeah. Being everything faced on my shoulders. You didn't run from it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the thing is, though, I didn't, fa- I didn't face it. I even buried myself into alcohol. Oh, I, see. I, yeah. I became, an, um, um, I dealt with it by drowning. From the unhealthy it. ways, you masked it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I became, I became an alcoholic, and it was like, I mean, I'll admit, for you, know, I would, I would wake up, I'd go to the gas station that was next door, start drinking as soon as the wife went to work, and then as soon as she came home, it's like I'd. All right, fake it till you make it. Act like I was sober, fain, or I only had a couple of drinks. But by that time, I was like a twelve pack in or so, or yeah. even more. I mean, I was up near up to about a case of beer per day, yeah. if if not more. Mm-hmm. And and it and I had I had a, attempted therapy sessions. I went to the VA therapist a few times, but um all i felt it was was lip service it's mm-hmm. like i'd go to these i'd go to these doc doctors and they'd try to okay tell me what's wrong tell me and it was all lip service because i didn't feel like it was genuine it's like okay i'm going to tell you what's wrong with me but it's like you're just gonna all you gotta do is label me as something right and so I would, you want help you don't want a pill or a label like yeah it's like i don't want yeah. i mean okay you're gonna shove pills down my throat all right, right. fine and so it's like, but I kept on drinking and then, you know, and so it's like, and the wife, she, bless her heart. I love her to death. She, she put up with so much mm-hmm. for me. I had anger issues. I had black, mm-hmm. I had, you know, I would have rages and everything else. Mm-hmm. I mean, but I mean, I never laid a hand on her. I never got physical mm-hmm. with anybody. Mm-hmm. It was more, I would, um, it's, it was more self-harm mm-hmm. and I'm, and, and I'll admit, I mean, I, I mean, I even had, I had, I had um, two suicide attempts. Mm-hmm. And so I understand all of this personally. And, so, yeah, I remember us talking in our, our um, when we first met and everything mm-hmm. else. And the first attempt, my, I mean, I'll be honest, my first suicide attempt was while I was still in. I was after my first mm-hmm. deployment. Mm-hmm. And it was because I knew something felt different. I didn't feel myself. And it's like I just felt, you know, everybody would be better off if I wasn't there trying to, and they didn't have to, they want to which, have to carry me. Which again, obviously subsequently is like a telltale sign of the traumatic brain injury. You had just, just, yeah. you know, endeared and, and all these, and also just the, you know, anyway, the subsequent yeah, pressure but, of that. And, and because that at that time, just, yeah, because at that time, it's like, you know, I'm just letting everybody down. So I knew there was changes, but it's like, mm-hmm. but then of course, you know, I'm still here. I mean, that first time yeah, out. Thank goodness. Well, the only thing that happened, I woke up sick as a dog and freaking mm. puked my guts out. So it's like, mm. all right, you know, but it was a wake up call at that time. It's like, all right, you know, just suck it up, move on. That's mm-hmm. the thing. Um, and then, of course, you know, I had another suicide attempt after I got out. And that was a slew of other things I won't go into details on. But, sure, um, sure. 
but then wife started graduate school, we moved and that's kind of when everything kind of came to a head. I was cleaning up, I was in charge of moving. I, and it's like, and me, I hid everything. I would hide bottles, I'd had cans, I'd hide mm-hmm. the cases mm-hmm. to throw out later. And as, we were, as I was packing and I was trying to move, I filled up about three yard bags full of cans bottles that i'd hidden throughout the house throughout mm-hmm. the apartment and i looked at them as i was pulling pull i actually had to pull them out to the garbage and i'm like i called my wife up on the phone after i called the va and i said honey i need help mm-hmm. like it, it got it because sitting in front of me was a representation right. of what i was burying myself in right so, and fortunately, when we got- For you, um, man, you did the exact right things. It's the VA and your wife, your partner, you did like the safest, smartest things to take care and of yourself. Like I said, the wife was a trooper. I mean, she, she would always be like, hey, I think you might need, I think it'd be good for you to, to go talk to somebody. She always mm-hmm. she would always encourage sure. me to try to go out to like that center. So, you know, hey, get to talking with people or like go mm-hmm. meet people, make some friends or anything else. Of course, hey, I made a great friend. His name was Joe. He was a bartender at the bar down the street. Right. I mean, and <laughs> I mean, as sweet as guy as he is, I, mean, I ended up later I mean, accepting the fact that he was my enabler. It's like, oh, sure. Yeah, because he was he was an, he was a previous he was, he was a he was a marine, mm-hmm. and he's in. Um, and I mean, and so it's like he was. A yeah, I'm sure unknowingly yeah. to him, you know, you guys yeah. had this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, and this yeah, is how you both do. Yeah, it's like, all right, here, man, have a drink. Yeah. Hey, half price drinks every day. Okay, fine. But, right. um, and that's, a- you know, you said it earlier a little bit, but like the importance of picking, like, not necessarily good mentorship, but even just a positive circle, like going to, look, if, you, if you're going to be with drinkers, you're going to drink. <laughs> like, if you're going to be yeah. with non drinkers, you're not going to drink. Like, it's like if you choose those things kind of wisely, you can kind of circumvent some of those things. And, um, and that's no fault of his own. That man was just yeah. dealing with his own pain, right? But well, but, well it, he was doing his job, and he was being the sounding board. And yeah. ultimately, it all came down to me. And right. you know, and the hardest, the hardest part about it was finally coming to terms and admitting that hey, I needed help. There's something. There's some. I'm carrying a lot of this weight that I, mean, I shouldn't be carrying. Yeah. And, and um, I was very fortunate to when I got into the, got back to the VA, I actually had a really great therapist. Good. And, you know, it's like, you know, at first it started out with the whole kind of, oh, lip service. She doesn't know that, you know, she can't emphasize with me. Mm. And so, but, you know, I, I'm, I told her, you know, you know, and I told her that straight up. It's like, okay, this is why the other therapist didn't work. It's like, I felt it was lip service. It's like, and she was, I mean, she was straight up honest with me. She's like, you know, I'm, she's like, I'm going to be that same way. But unlike these other therapists, I'm going to put a foot, foot to your ass and you're going to freaking, we're going to get to the bottom of this. Mm-hmm. And over the course of the next year, it's, you know, it, I, she did put that foot to my ass. Yeah. And yeah. It's a good thing. That's what I needed. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, but, um, and this is one another, one thing I learned too, especially in counseling and social work is that, you know, yeah, I was drinking, I have a heavy drinking problem, but that wasn't the focus. That actually was not the focus of my therapy at all. Mm. I mean, she's like, we need to, she told me that we need to, um, treat the underlying factors that are right. causing you to drink. Right. And so it's like, we need to alleviate some of this weight on your shoulders. That's mm. causing you to drink and everything else. And it, all, what it came to boil down at and i'm trying not to ramble because wife you're doing great yeah. well wife reminded me last night that once i get talking once i start doing this i st- i tend to ramble dude you're but, fascinating well it's like yeah but <laughs> you're great like, i believe it's like sometimes people with brain injuries they have to ramble because that's how they get things out to make the connection yeah and when you don't it, it frustrates it frustrates that person with the tbi because they're trying to express what mm-hmm. how they can to somebody what they're feeling inside and if mm-hmm. you interrupt them if you tell them you know hey you're rambling or anything else it disrupts their I mean yeah nature and so it's like then it frustrates them more and it makes them retreat so mm-hmm. and 
I mean, I had a personal experience with that way back mm-hmm. in the day. And so my wife was actually there to um, witness it too. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, it was not a good thing. I, mean, I, was, <laughs> I, was trying to, I was trying to give a speech to somebody kept on snickering or saying something on the side. Mm-hmm. I lost my place. I got frustrated. I had to leave. I broke mm-hmm. down crying and the, mm-hmm. And it's frustrating, but well, like that's a good example, maybe like you know, going back to a little bit to like life today, like nobody's life is easy, you know. We all have our own challenges, we all have our own adversity, like something like that, right? Your life has been it's changed, you know, and and those things we're gonna encounter those kind of interactions and all. Like, how do you best deal with that? Can you like just to try to stay positive, you know? Like, I mean, do you have a technique or an exercise you use? I take a deep breath a lot breathing. of times and yeah and it's almost simple as breathing i mean it's yeah. what i can say is that i mean what i mean what might work for me might not work for somebody else yeah you're right but but it's all about having those tools available to you in that mm-hmm. tool bag because i mean you know as i was saying it's like i went back to, and as i was saying i went to therapy and i was able to get all the a lot of this emotional baggage off my shoulders mm-hmm. but the thing is though it might be up on, off my shoulders but i have it in a little quote-unquote cabinet to the side mm-hmm. but in, but um and this is where i can't i'm going to get kind of informational here is that because and after i went to therapy and everything else my wife encouraged me okay let's let's get you back into school let's get you back into finding a new because i because at this point i wasn't going into law enforcement Mm. I knew that I, mean, I wasn't going to the criminal justice field. And so it's like, and she, and so it's like, we were spinning around ideas to, as to what I'd go back to school for. And I'm like, well, I kind of want to be a history teacher. Cause I'm a huge history buff. I love right. history. And she's like, well, okay. And of course my wife, you know, she's very in tune with, I mean, you know her, you grew up. Uh, yeah. Oh, so I might have to more, I'll you. say very, uh, she's, she's extremely intelligent, more, she, very structured. She's very, very ambitious. Head. Yeah, very Right. Ambitious. So I imagine if you were going to make a plan with her, you're on board. You know, yeah. and, so, yeah. and, and so it's like, I told her, it's like, I want to be a history teacher. And she's like, okay, are you sure about that? I'm like, yeah, I mean, I love history. I want to be able to pass this knowledge on to people. It's like, okay, what's your patience like with little kids? I'm like, oh, I love little kids, man. I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm a big guy. I mean, I'm mm-hmm. sitting like, and you know, and I even had one person say that like, you're very intimidating because you're a big guy. It's like you're six four. We know, it's like you're a veteran and everything else. But I'm like, so it's like okay. So you view me as a grizzly bear, mm-hmm. except the fact, except I'm a huge teddy bear. Yeah, big guy, big heart. Yeah. And once my Adderall kicks in, I'm more like Teddy Rockspin from the '80s that has a broken <laughs> freaking cord. You pull the cord and he just won't shut up. Yeah, yeah. And, so yeah. That's, and that's what, and that's how my rambling is. Um, so it's like I. I do explain to people, it's like, okay, you know, okay, let's keep this whole facade of, you know, I'm a grizzly bear. Let's keep that there. So that way, you know, but in reality, I'm a huge teddy bear. And I'll yeah, that. And I'm, for sure. I'm one of the nicest people, being one of the most laid back people that you'll ever meet. Right. But it's like, I'm not, I'm not afraid to be truthful with you. I'm not afraid to be, tell you how it is. Right. So, and she's like, okay, you know, little kids, you know, they feel and, she, and so we went through the whole spiel. It's like, okay, I mean, that's probably not the best world for me, especially mm-hmm. teaching. Mm-hmm. And so, and so I'm like, and she's like, well, just let's spend a couple of days. Let's do this. And um, growing up, I mean, growing up in a law enforcement family, teachers, mm-hmm. everything, you know, it's like, it always, I was in farming, you know, mm-hmm. I always had that selfless kind of service about me. Yeah, so, sure. And I was looking back and, and I was looking, I was doing a lot of reflection on myself because one of my projects that my therapist had me do was come up with a way to um, channel myself. And I came and coincidentally, I was listening to Michael Jackson on the way to mm-hmm. an appointment when we did this. And, was, and I called it my man in the mirror. Nice. It's like every morning, every morning I made a conscientious effort to look at myself in the mirror and tell my Oh, you, you did mirror work. That's yeah. like, that's yeah, my dude. thing. I preach it. That's amazing. And it's like oh. every morning, I, every morning I looked at myself, it's like, all right, you know, it's like you had a rough day yesterday or you had a good day yesterday. How are we going to do this? It's like, and I always, and I'd have, hold a conversation with myself. And so, and I have all these experiences. I have all these 
tools and everything else available to me, I'm going to go into social work because mm -hmm. I mean, it mm -hmm. allows me to work with people, assist people. At, mm -hmm. and, it, and it had everything available to me that I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. so I went back to school. I went to Middle Tennessee State mm -hmm. and graduated with my bachelor's. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at that time, it's like I still had plenty of my GI Bill left because luckily, you know, I didn't have to take my general ed courses. So I had plenty of time. Okay. I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm, I was confident in myself. You know, I'm going to go after my master's. Let's see how far I can go with myself. And mm -hmm. at that time, my friend adrenaline was pumping. I was confident in myself and went went through the University of Tennessee, got my master's of social work mm -hmm. and, you know, finished with, I think, I think I actually finished with a 4.0 through my grad school. Which is, and, and I don't mean to derail you, but I just want to pause to acknowledge that just to say like what a huge accomplishment is. And I just want you to hear it. And I, again, don't, I don't mean oh. to interrupt you, but man, look, you went through a physical and emotional and mental trauma that completely changed your life put you in a different direction and then you still found the wherewithal even though you had a good partnership and 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 your wife and a good support system but man these were your goals and you committed to it and you graduated and then you took it to a master's it's beautiful dude and there's veterans out there that i know are likely feeling probably really lost and they're trying to pick what is that thing for me i thought it would be that you know and you did it man like it's, well, and, it's, it's, and the funniest and the funniest part about it is that i got better grades after being diagnosed with, after having a TBI than I did back in high school. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. My, GP, my, um, my GPA is actually better post TBI than it was pre TBI. Do you and think it's like, just because you were so committed, you were just so in? I think it was because, um, yeah, like I was a lot more committed to it, but it is also because, you know, it's like I've, I'd found myself again. I mean, back in high school, I was, like I said, I was kind of, not really a loner but it's like i was just kind of all over the place in high school it's like i just mm -hmm. wanted to please everybody but and but this time around it was for myself mm -hmm. it's like i wanted i had i wanted to do this for me it wasn't for me it wasn't for anybody else i mm -hmm. i mean yeah part of it was to please autumn to, and to honestly shut her up and get her to leave me alone about it but to but, see it through but but, but yeah. after i after i got it through it and it was actually almost kind of like an extension of my therapy as well because oh it's a huge accomplishment because up to that point in time it's like i was allowing ptsd to control who i was hence the alcoholism and everything else now i'll have maybe one or two beers a week maybe two weeks mm -hmm. and that's it but um mm -hmm. did you and maybe this is just a silly question um but did you hang that diploma up is that in a place where every day you get to walk by it and see it Right now, it's actually in a box. Cause oh, yeah, that's right. It's, yeah. It's like, yeah, that's a silly question. If, yeah. If, yeah, if the wife asked me, hey, where's this? It's in a box somewhere. Yeah, so he's moving. Home. For those that aren't aware, he's, he just yeah. built a brand new home. <laughs> yeah, so we're getting ready to move in there. Yeah. So it's like everything's packed up. I, I have, And this is actually one of the good things that came from my TBI. It's like have, and having to rewire my brain to be more organized, be more conscious it's, mm. all, the, all the boxes are labeled every box has, <laughs> nice yeah all the, all the boxes are labeled with what room they're going to what's in that box mm, beautiful whatnot. and you know and my attention is when we get into the house if it doesn't go into the house anywhere we're donating it it's like nice. yeah. get rid of get rid of best thing best way to declutter move purge yeah <laughs> and move it, I love and, it. And, I'll, and, I've, and i'll admit i actually have the purge siren on my phone Mm. whenever i would go do that thing it's as hilarious as well. yeah and so um i but, think uh, but going I back think to, going back to school change. was yeah. yeah but going back to school was actually an extension of my therapy in mm -hmm. a way because it got me involved in the social aspect again yeah. it got me back with like-minded people again and my advice to a lot of other people is you know find find that little place of yourself again you know it's like find yourself a new purpose no matter what it may be Mm. mine was going back to school it got me back to being social and another thing was rc racing and we can hit on that later if mm -hmm. there's time sure, but, sure. but going back to school it's like i started learning that after sitting through about a month of the classes and everything else it's like and i mean that's and that's honestly all i did was i actually just sat there i listened mm. i learned mm. and then like subjects uh, such as like ptsd came up i mean mm. working with veterans working with mental yeah, health, sure. health and everything else came up and i just listened 
And as and I sat there listening, it's like, you know, it's like, I I saw. I mean, I am, and I learned a lot just from listening. Yes. And what I learned was, you know, a lot of these people that I was in school with. I mean, they were of all ages. I mean, mm-hmm. eighteen. They ranged from eighteen to up to fifty-two. Mm-hmm. And you know, and I learned that you know, not a lot of people, not a lot of them knew, really knew about PTSD. I mean, they knew like the diagnostics of it. They knew the medical side of it. Right. But it's like, but I'm like, so it's like, I'm like, I started pushing myself on my comfort zone. Yeah. I, I started speaking up more and I started advocating more for, you know, okay, these, these are my experiences. This is what I'm learning from. Mm-hmm. And so instead of using PTSD as a crutch, as a reason to get out of things or using PTSD yeah. as a way oh, of, man, and so of letting, of letting PTSD control me. Yeah. I now use it as a freaking tool in one of my tool bags. It's like, you know, it's like I, I've learned from it. I've, I mean, I, I mean, I still have my good days. I still have my really bad yeah. days. I have my horrible days. I mean, yeah. Um, you said something that uh, th- for those out there that have PSD, I think is going to ring. It, it, it rung a bell to me. Um, you know, part of your empowerment there, you said, I'm not going to use my PTSD as a reason not to go do something. And man, I felt that because f- it controlled me for years and kept me from being so social. And I missed so many opportunities and, and I was a terrible friend. I I remember what made me change was a friend of mine. um, And this isn't about me, but man, this just, this man, this corrected me really quick. A friend of mine described me as more of a taker than a giver. Yeah. And that, Oh, that wrecked me because I never thought of myself that way. And I never wanted to ever be that way. And then, I thought about it and she, I was like, you know what? She's right. In in our relationship, I never showed up. I was never there to support. I was never, because I was dealing with my own things, you know? So anyway, and it wasn't until I started getting therapy and help and realizing there was other people out there that were struggling like that. And I, you know, I didn't feel so like, I, I felt braver maybe to go out, yeah. you know? And, and it's important to just kind of tell yourself, you know, baby steps, you know? Yeah. Like, it's like for me, I challenge myself. It's like, I have to challenge myself. I have to push myself mm-hmm. to into uncomfortable situations. And I have to remind myself, it's like, you know, any step forward, whether it's an inch or whether it's a freaking mile, mm-hmm. no matter how many, no matter how much, how small a step it might be, as long as you're going forward, yes. I think it's what matters. But another thing you have to remind yourself is too, it's like, you're allowed to have bad days. You're allowed to have mm-hmm. moments and it's, it it's doesn't okay. make you weak. It doesn't no, make you lose progress. You just have to no. recharge, right? It is okay to be you and let yourself mm-hmm. be in that moment. Mm-hmm. But in, but what the important thing is, is to allow yourself to pick yourself up and move, continue moving forward. And that's, that's one of the hardest lessons I learned was you know, allowing myself to, yeah, I have this emotional baggage. I have this mental baggage. But you know what? I mean, it's kind of like training. It's kind of like the workouts that you've given me and everything else. Like, okay, I'm I might be doing a workout. I might feel like that little twinge in my shoulder and everything else. Okay, I might just have to adjust how I do things a little bit. Sure. But I'm still sure. putting forth that effort. And so, and I think that's the biggest thing for me right now is mm-hmm. you know, working with you on the workout side and everything else. It's like, um, and especially with school, especially with you know, admitting that I needed help was, Mm -hmm. you know, moving forward and accepting, uh, I can't remember the quote exactly, but it's like accepting the things that you are and accepting the things that you aren't. Yeah. So, and it's important to have that balance and, you know, I know, and I know I'm not the same person as I was before. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's like, I'm not, I know I'm not the same person day by day, Mm -hmm. but you feel like you're probably cooler though. Like on a level, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm never, I'm never cooler. Thing. I'm, no, I'm, I'm really. I'm the, I'm the geek. I'm the freaking. No, but I mean, like you've seen. Look, I, I mean, look. You could have been. You could have been that guy that was in Iowa and yeah. became a farmer or became a teacher locally, and that that's awesome. Like I'm not in any way. Oh, yeah. oh that. no. I mean, but you saw I'm... the world. You live in. You live in. A, you build a beautiful home now. You have your dog. Like, I just feel like even though the the trial and the adversity that for sure you had to go through in between there. Like, I feel like you're, you're like a cool grown man. 
like you've seen some cool stuff like see, see that is one of the words that was never associated with me was cool so it's like I'm, i've been <laughs> no it's hard so to feel that, that way about that's, ourselves. that's weird that's weird hearing that word yeah. referred to me it's like oh man you're cool i'm like what mm-hmm. no i it's, get it i get it I mean, no it, you're cool like, to me man for sure yeah, no, no, i appreciate it and um but you know, it's like, I know you're probably needing to wrap things up or whatever. I know you're probably- yeah, here in a minute. But I feel like one more, one more thing before I, I, I let you go too, just because like it's awesome. Like I feel like you touched on a lot of stuff. You gave a lot of really good advice about people kind of just helping them find, them, find a new purpose and empowering themselves. Uh, that's just awesome. Um, I feel like one last thing too, like outside of just the military stuff, like we'll digress, man, RC cars. Wait, tell yeah. me real quick, your passion there. Is this a, are you tinkering? Are you building? Are you selling, trading? Are you racing? Uh, I, I race RC cars. My wife's, uh, my wife's dad is actually the one that got me into RC racing. And okay. it, it was mainly a way to get me out of the house. Get And because I mean, I mean, I'm not, I, I'll be the first to admit, I am not easy to live with, <laughs> especially at that time. And sure, sure. And to give you a quick little backstory, me and Autumn met while I was in the hospital. Mm. I was, I'd been in the hospital for like three weeks. I, if you remember the movie Encino Man and Polly yeah. Shore, love it. I was yeah. Polly, I was Polly Shore. I smelled, looked, and acted like freaking a caveman coming out of ice. And so it's like we met when I was, and we originally met because she used to work for the VA, and I was going through the VA claim process at the time. And so, and she came in, and I keep on telling her she only came back for the free chocolate milk that she was siphoning from the second mm. fridge. Mm. And so, and, um, but at that time I had no other place to go for, and I had, I didn't really have a support system up in Iowa. And at that time I was living with an ex-girlfriend that, you know, I won't go into that situation there, but it was not a healthy situation. Mm-hmm. So I mean, she actually took me home and I always do it with her. Like I'm the original rescue animal. I'm the stray that she took in. She just, she fed, she fed me, watered me, tickled my tummy. And I just never left. Like, yeah. I just, <laughs> so That's I it. squatted, I squatted. Yeah, yeah. And so, but you know, here we are I mean, 10 years later, Oh, 11 years later, we're married now. And, um, but yeah, her dad is actually the one that got me into RC racing. At first it was something just to get me out of the house, to get me tinkering and such. And so, but it really did help. It helped me with my social skills. It helped me get back to talking with people. And it actually, and um, he actually saw the benefit that it was gonna, it would have with my brain injury. Mm. And so, because it, it, it worked with my, it would help with my um, critical thinking. It helped with my fine motor skills. Mm-hmm. These little RC cars, I mean, if you've run them. They're very powerful. They're powerful. I mean, I run electric, but, um, and I've built them. I mean, you have to build them and yeah. fix them. I mean, they're they're very complicated little machines, and they're, I mean, they're not the typical you know go to Walmart buy one right, out of the right. box. And this, right. the, 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 these have very very intricate little parts and very and setups that you have to use. Sure. So it's like you're constantly having to use your brain and everything else. And you know, much so much credit goes out to him for having the patience to help teach me all mm. these things. And so, I mean, and if you, if you ever get interested in, um, RC racing, where go to live rc.com mm. and they, and they, sh- they show live races and I can, I'll send you the links to it and everything else. And, um, but they have live races on there quite a bit because mm-hmm. there's a lot of local tracks that, mm-hmm. and there's a lot of local tracks that, you know, if you're, you don't, have to, and I mean, there's a lot of local tracks that will have loaner cars or sure. I mean, if, if anybody after watching this, if they're interested in RC racing, I mean, just look look up the local tracks in your area. Oh, and yeah. I mean, there's, because a lot of times there will be racers there that will take you under the wing. Sure. You go in, talk to them. They're so, they're an awesome community to be a part of. And so, yeah. I mean, they, they will talk with you. And if you have interest, some of them might have loaner cars that you, they'll let you pick out, mm-hmm. drive around a little bit, you know, feel. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it, it can be an expensive hobby, but mm. if you're just starting out, there are so many people that are willing to help you start out. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and that's what he did. And so, um, but it's, it's actually a lot of fun as mm-hmm. long as you're not crashing and breaking into a lot of things yeah. like I have been. Because I took a few months off and I went back last, well, a couple weekends ago and needless to say, I literally had to knock the rest off. Oh really? You lose tech. Yeah. You gotta feel it again. I broke. I, I broke a few things. Yeah. So, yeah. And that was, but it is really fun. Yeah. And 
and I guess to close out this kind of conversation is that, you know, anybody can, I mean, you, I think you've posted my Facebook or whatnot. It's like, if anybody ever wants to reach out to me via Facebook mm -hmm. or Instagram or anything else, feel free. Cause I mean, the worst thing that somebody can feel is feeling alone. Mm -hmm. right. I know how that goes. And, you know, right. if you just, I mean, if you just want to talk, if you want, if you just want to just vent things or ask anything, you know, I'm going to be there because the main reason I wanted the counseling is that, like I said, I got tired of the lip service. I got tired of yeah. being on that side of the, I got tired of being a person that went in and just got the lip service from the doctors right. and knowing that, okay, you don't have the kind of same experiences for me. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, I know what you're feeling because I don't right. know what you're feeling because every right. individual is different. Everybody's, everybody's got a different story. Everybody's got, there is no blanket therapy. There is, mm -hmm. and that's what a lot of, I think a lot of doctors kind of forget, especially later in the careers, that there is no blanket mm -hmm. therapy. Mm -hmm. you, you, you can have a blanket philosophy, sure. but you have to tailor it to every single person. And right. so, but it's like, if there's anybody that ever needs to reach out, because I mean, You've seen 22 a day for mm -hmm. veteran suicide is so high, mm -hmm. but nowadays it's not just veterans. It's everyday people. It's like, yes. And I don't want it to like, just narrow it down. To like if you're anybody out there, whether you're a veteran, whether you're non-veteran, anybody, it's like, if you just want to reach out, say something, you know, it's like get, if you need somebody to talk to, it's like, just reach out to talk to me. I'm always here for anybody mm. to talk to and I'll listen um, and I'll talk via text or anything you know it's a, mm -hmm. that's a thank good. you i mean and and he's definitely he's qualified folks <laughs> he does have a degree in this um and he, well, and he definitely yeah, has I'm, a lot of personal experience to call upon as well and i mean i'm 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 in the process of getting my license i've got the paperwork ready for it i just mm -hmm. i'm waiting for get to get into the house to like fully jump sure. into that well because it took me a little while to transition here to vegas because i mean sure i mean if you've been to Tennessee, if you've been to Vegas, they are two different climates. They are two different yes. things. Yeah. I mean, I mean, the, the common thing is that nobody can drive out here. Nobody can drive in Vegas. <laughs> That's it, the only just, common it's thing. Just, it's just like the rest of the United States. There's people that cannot drive. Right. And, and oh, God, my, I'm going to get hell for this. But, uh, when, we, when we drove out here to Vegas, we drove in. Um, and, of course, you know, Midwest, everything else, you have the lines to distinguish the lanes in the road and everything else mm -hmm. well out here because of the heat and everything the paint doesn't exactly it, if they painted lines they're mm -hmm. so much money repainting them year over year because the, mm. they would fade because of the sun. so they have the ceramic dots whatever right right we, so when we first got here and it's like there's dots on the road I'm like i turned to my wife i'm like are they teaching blind people how to drive and, yeah what is, is that, this yeah. is that is that is that i mean i'm not trying to be rude or anything else <laughs> I mean, You've never seen that. Yeah. If you know me, my sense of humor is pretty freaking dark. It's pretty, I mean, it's out there, but I've been, that's, and then that's where one thing that the wife has actually helped me with is she's kind of got my humor. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. I mean, behind doors and everything else, it's good. You'll hear, you'll hear things that come out of my mouth that makes you feel like I should be in a mental health asylum. Yeah. Somewhere. I feel like we all feel that way. We all have those yeah. thoughts. It's just whether you share. I mean, you know? in the, in the past, some of these jokes would make the doctors have those metal things go up on my head, <laughs> shock, giving me shocks. But um, it's like, no, it's like, as soon as we got here, it's like, I learned to my wife, it's like, is this Braille on the road? Is it, I mean, is, are they like, like mm -hmm. and so it's like, so it's like, to anybody that works with Braille or blind or anything else, I'm sorry, I, I'm not trying to be disrespectful or anything else. It's just, oh, I think you're good. It's like a training course. It's totally different. Yeah, no, it's like, okay, stay within the lines, but now mm -hmm. it's like you're staying. Because anytime I heard that rumble, rumble, boom, boom, mm -hmm. boom, it's like, oh crap, I'm off the side of the road. Now right. it's like I could be in the middle of the road, middle lane, and it's like I hear that rumble. It's like I want to jerk one way or another. And it's like mm -hmm. I can't do that because oh. right, right, right. My accidents are frowned upon by insurance. So. Mm -hmm. Well, ma'am, we're coming up on time. Um, thank you again so much for sharing everything about your your unique experience here. Also, uh, extending an, you know an open invitation for folks to reach out. I, that's really huge and kind of you. Um, so, with that, this is True Story with John Gibson. Thank you again for watching.